Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm happy to finally show you the process of how I painted this Mount Fuji painting. You might have already seen it over on my Instagram. On the left, you can see a picture I took on my first trip to Japan, and on the right is the finished painting. Painting this picture has taught me many valuable lessons, and I hope you'll enjoy the creative journey. But, let's start from the beginning. I'm going to keep this very light by the way, so if you're looking for a relaxing video after work, to fall asleep to, or just to keep you some company, I think you've come to the right place. So, I've started out with a very light pencil sketch. I didn't try to exactly match the proportions of the original photograph, I was aiming more for something that felt pleasing to me. What you see in the middle is the version that came after the pencil sketch. I used blue masking fluid to cover the parts of the paper that I wanted to stay white. And this is important as I wanted to work with watercolour where you mostly want to start out with lighter colours and gradually work your way towards darker shades. The right side is when I started to actually film the process. I had already applied one layer of blue watercolour and a very light yellow tone for the stairs at the bottom of the picture. I'm obviously not a professional fine artist by the way, so this is just my way of trying out things and having fun. A lot of what I've initially planned for actually failed or turned out differently than what I had in mind. But that made it all the more valuable to me, and I love learning new things. So, I feel like, especially when it comes to artwork, we shouldn't worry about sticking to certain procedures too much. Just exploring the medium and the creative process is so much more fun and always rewarding. Now you can see I'm trying to loosely block in some background colours. On the right side, I'm focusing on the lower part of the picture. In the middle, you'll see the progress on the upper part. I really liked adding in the sakura branches. There's something very satisfying about the organic shapes of trees. Though it can be a little challenging to get the brush pressure just right at the end of a branch. Painting in the buildings in the background has been fun too. I wanted to keep it rather abstract, so I decided to just add some colour blotches, indicating the distant rooftops. I took this picture in 2019, by the way, at the famous Chureito Pagoda, just about two hours outside of Tokyo. It's a really beautiful place. Even if you haven't been to Japan yet, you've probably seen it on a travel guide cover, a calendar, Instagram, or anywhere else on the internet, really. A five-story pagoda, framed by cherry blossom trees, and Mount Fuji here in the background. Such an iconic view. I imagine fewer pictures are taken on the way down from the pagoda, but I think this view is just as spectacular. I remember sitting on the ground to the side of the road for a long time, just staring at Mount Fuji and all the tiny houses in the distance, and at the sakura trees. Despite all the tourists around, this was such a peaceful moment. I couldn't have been any happier. After all this time, all those years, I'd finally made it to Japan. And even though this had already been day 20 of my trip, it only just started to really sink in. It felt like seeing Mount Fuji right there in front of me finally made it seem more real if that makes sense.
the sakura trees were at very different stages of bloom at the time. Some seemed to be at around 60%, while others were only just starting to open up. For this painting, I wanted to ignore the different stages and just go for a lush, fluffy cherry blossom vibe. At least for the trees on the bottom part of the picture. As you can see, I'm putting in some more loose colours for the background of the trees and bushes on the lower part of the picture here. It looks a bit patchy, but it's just meant as a base colour to add to later on. The size of this painting is A2, which is pretty large for what I'm used to working with. I think I've actually ever just once before used this size for a proper painting, and even that has been more of a watercolour sketch than anything else. So, what you're watching here is basically me exploring uncharted waters. And I'm not even that used to working with colour to be honest. Most of the time I will just grab a pencil and do loose sketches for fun characters, or to get design ideas out of my head. I'm not sure why, I think maybe using colour is just a bit more intimidating, isn't it? But working with colour is also incredibly fun. It's so fascinating to figure out the right values and to be creative in finding satisfying combinations. I'm so happy I took on this challenge. Sometimes... We have to leave our comfort zones to grow, right? And this painting really taught me a lot. One of the first things I started to realise at about this point is that proper watercolour paper has been invented for a reason. It's a great idea to use it. I have learned this lesson before, but... Sometimes I refuse to learn from previous mistakes. So, you can already see a little bit. Even though I've used rather strong paper, it's starting to warp because it can't handle the amount of water I'm using. Uh, you know, sometimes things just aren't perfect. More about that later. Painting in the details of the upper branches has been interesting. One thing I love about painting and drawing alike is that it forces you to really look at your subject in a way that you might not otherwise. For example, it's easy to just imagine a branch full of evenly distributed cherry blossoms. But the blossoms on this tree seem to open up starting from the tips on the small branches, which creates a very unique shape. I've switched to a much smaller brush for these details, and it took me a bit to get used to it. Drawing with a stiff pencil and carefully applying the correct pressure to flexible bristles is a very different thing, but in the end, it's just another kind of motion your muscles will eventually memorise. It's always just about practice. I'd love to know if you've been painting or drawing before. What's your favourite medium? What do you like to draw or paint? Let me know in the comments, I'm very curious. And if you haven't tried it yet, I hope this video might encourage you to do so. Take a picture of something you like and try to paint it. Or just let your mind wander and explore the medium you're working with. It might be a great way for you to express yourself or help you relax. Don't be afraid of messing up. It's all part of the journey. And art is so subjective, really. I've heard a lot of people say, I'm not talented enough to paint, and they feel like they have to be able to fulfill some strange criteria before they allow themselves to pick up a brush. 
but that's not true. Everyone starts somewhere, and as long as the activity itself brings you joy, that's everything that matters. I did get myself a small keyboard about three years ago. I have no idea how to play it, but I can spend hours just tapping the keys and enjoying the sounds it makes. So, if you feel like picking up a pencil or a brush would bring you joy, I think you should do it. The upper branches appear rather dark against the bright blue sky, so I already started out with a darker colour. But some of the blossoms do get some nice highlights, which is why I use the blue masking fluid here and there. And again, I'm using very light pink shades at first so I can slowly transition towards darker shades. That doesn't always mean you have to mix in or use a darker colour. If you're working with watercolour, you can just apply the same colour several times and the shade will gradually get darker. You can easily see this on Mount Fuji here. I just used the same colour and applied it several times to darken the lower parts. Mount Fuji is famous for various reasons, by the way. It's 3,776 meters high, which makes it the highest mountain in Japan. It's no secret that Mount Fuji is a volcano, but that you know that you can actually hike up to the top? It takes the average person about six hours to get there. Due to difficult weather conditions, the hike is only recommended from early July to early September, but I've heard it's well worth the planning. I really, really, really want to get up there at some point to watch the sunrise. How cool would that be? And I wonder if you could see the Chureito Pagoda from the top if you'd use binoculars. What do you think? If you'd like to visit the Tsureito Pagoda, I'd very much recommend you to get there as early as possible. I got there at around 10am, which was perfect for the way up. But it got crowded rather quickly. I think I took one of the earliest connections from Tokyo, but if you have the chance to stay in the neighbourhood without the need to travel in the morning, I'm sure you'll be able to enjoy this place in a very quiet atmosphere. In Japan, Mount Fuji is called Fujisan. San is used as an honorific suffix to people's names, similar to how Mrs and Mr are being used as titles in English. People often think that Fuji-san is used to express special respect to Mount Fuji, but actually, San, in this case, is just a different reading of the character Yama, which means mountain. So, Fujiyama means Mount Fuji, and Fuji-san means Mount Fuji as well. I've read that there is a Japanese saying that goes, A wise person climbs Mount Fuji once in their lifetime, but only a fool would climb it twice. Interesting, right? After reading about it, I looked up the original saying and had Google translate it for me. I actually like that version even better. It said, An idiot who never climbs, an idiot who climbs twice. I love it. I imagine it refers to the difficulties of the hike, but as far as I know, it's not considered extremely challenging. Reasonable preparations are important, though. Oh, I can't wait.
Let's talk about masking fluid for a second. Because that's the second big thing I've learned during this process. At this time, I didn't actually intend on using white acrylic color for any highlights. I thought it would be enough to mask off everything and this way prevent pigment from touching the paper. Then once the painting is finished, it's easy to just peel off the dry masking fluid. But here's the thing. While you're watching this whole painting process in one session right now, it actually took me quite a while to finish. And there were some long breaks in between. All in all, I recorded this on the side over the span of 10 months. Little did I know that masking fluid is not supposed to sit on paper for longer than a few hours or days. Also, it's a good idea to test the compatibility of the fluid and the paper you're working with in advance. So, as you can see here, when it was time for me to remove the fluid, it just didn't come off at all. I tried a lot of things, but in the end it just started to damage the paper. All I could really do was to remove bits and pieces of some of the thicker layers, but that hardly changed anything about the fact that the areas I wanted to stay unpigmented were all blue now. I'm gonna be honest with you, that was a huge setback and discouragement for me, as I was really looking forward to finish the painting the way I had imagined it to look like all this time. At that point, I set it aside for a while. I thought about starting over from scratch, but I really liked where it was going. I liked the vibe that was going on, and didn't love the idea of giving up on it. It might sound strange, but I felt like I had a special connection with it. At one point, I thought about how I feel like these days. We often try too hard to make things perfect and we lose fun and authenticity over it. That reminded me of the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi and the famous kintsugi technique. Maybe I was just looking at this with the wrong mindset. If you've never heard of wabi-sabi or kintsugi before, let me try to explain in a second. But just so you know what's going on in the painting, I decided to take things as they were and change my point of view. We can't give up just because we make mistakes, right? I mean, what even are mistakes in art? Aren't they just happy little accidents anyways, like Bob Ross always used to say? So for some parts, I started to use white acrylic paint to go over the masking fluid. Luckily, the paint stuck to it easily. Acrylic paint also works well on top of watercolour, so there really weren't any issues with this approach. For other parts, instead of trying to hide them, I wanted to put emphasis on those happy little accidents by using gold paint. What was really cool is that I'd gotten the gold paint years ago and only ever used it once since then. Isn't that such a pity? I should really use it more often. This was the perfect opportunity. And all of a sudden I felt inspired again. I had so much fun. Just look at how beautiful the gold paint catches the light. Now let's talk about Kintsugi first. Maybe you've heard of it before. Or maybe you've even seen a beautiful Kintsugi bowl. Kintsugi means golden joinery, 
It's a Japanese art form and technique to repair broken things with gold. Most commonly pottery. Think tea bowl, vases or plates. So if a precious or meaningful object breaks, its parts are kept and carefully reassembled. After mending them with lacquer, the breakage lines get dusted with pure gold powder, which gives the object a very unique look. This process can take a very long time, and it's stunning to watch. Check out some YouTube videos on this matter if you're interested. I found them to be very calming and fascinating. The idea behind this technique is to accept and embrace brokenness and imperfections as part of what life is and to celebrate them. This way you're making things even more beautiful than they were before. To me, it almost feels like putting a batch of honor to something that has been going through a process of repair, showing gratitude and saying, thank you for making it this far. And I think this can very well be applied to other things than pottery as well. <laughs> I really hope this makes sense. I started to really enjoy bringing in just whatever medium made sense at the moment. This is a pastel chalk pencil. They're a little brittle, and usually you go ahead and smudge and blend the colors after applying pigment. I don't do this here, as I wanted to keep the sharper edges and intensity. But I made sure to get rid of any excess chalk dust after the painting was finished. It can be a bit tricky to do that, because you have to make sure you don't accidentally smudge it onto other areas of the painting. That can even happen if you just gently try to blow the pigment away, especially if it's dark pigment on a lighter background like this. So I completely turned the painting over and gave it some gentle pats to cause loose pigment to fall off. There might be a much better way to do it, that's just my workaround. I know a lot of artists also use sprays to make sure the chalk pigment sticks to the paper, but I don't do that either. I've tried it in the past, but it changed the colours of the painting and I didn't like the fumes. It sure does help to keep pigments in place though, and make storing a painting easier. As this one was going right onto my living room wall though, it didn't matter that much. The reason why I brought in the pastel chalk pencil is that I couldn't use watercolour in the areas where I had already applied the masking fluid. There was this area where the sakura branch crossed the top of Mount Fuji, and I figured the chalk might work on top of the dried fluid. And it did, as you can see. Plus the colour was perfect to add in a few more details to focus on. But before I fixed the branch, I decided to cover the top of Mount Fuji with gold. That was probably the most exciting part to paint, just because it had the most dramatic effect. And somehow, I completely forgot to leave out the part where the branch crossed into view. Well... Wabi-sabi isn't as easy to explain, unfortunately. In fact, I've heard that people try to avoid to define it in a precise way. Some even say that people who claim to be able to explain it haven't understood it at all. That sounds rather complicated, doesn't it? I would encourage you to dig a little deeper if you're interested, but I'll tell you how I've come to understand it so far. It's a concept of Japanese aesthetics. A way to view the world, if you will, that embraces imperfection and impermanence but it seems that wabi-sabi might mean something different to everyone. So maybe there's not even a need to nail it down precisely. Wabi-sabi doesn't translate very well into English, but wabi originally meant something along the lines of the loneliness of living in nature, whereas sabi literally meant rust, leaning towards the sense of withered. 
The meaning of both words has evolved over time though, and these days they seem to have a more positive connotation to them. I've read about very different interpretations, but Wabi always seems to be connected to the melancholy of loneliness, whereas Sabi seems to speak of the elegance of impermanence. While I was already using gold, I also added highlights to the lower trees. I didn't want those to draw too much attention compared to Mount Fuji, but covering some of the masking fluid and then later adding more regular petals would give them a nice, more subtle reflective effect. Now, after the gold had dried, I switched back to the chalk pencil and luckily it covered the gold as easily as the masking fluid. Wabi Sabi has deep roots in and has emerged from Zen Buddhism and the traditional art of Japanese tea ceremony, which puts emphasis on simplicity, modesty and tranquility. Another very influential factor has been nature. Japan's always had a very respectful and close relationship with nature, and Wabi Sabi seems to be strongly inspired by its raw and fleeting beauty. Accepting things as they are, instead of working against them, and seeing yourself as but a part of nature is an important aspect of it. If you take all of these facets as a lens and try to look at the world through it, you might find beauty in unexpected places. You might find appreciation for the uneven, carefully hand-shaped surface of a tea bowl its muted and quiet, soothing earth tones. You might see beauty in the weathered, peeling paint texture of an old wall, or in the way sunlight passes through a rice paper screen for just about 15 minutes each day. You might feel a sweet pain looking at the blooming sakura, knowing that soon their petals will fall, and yet appreciate their fleeting beauty all the more. When you see an old silk kimono with a stain, you might not see it as a fault, but maybe as part of its long history and think about how the food must have tasted delicious on that day instead. You might look at a plate that has been broken and reassembled and feel grateful for the work that went into it, just so you could enjoy not only the beautiful golden lines, but with them it's honest and unique display of imperfection. Again, this is just my momentary personal interpretation. It's lacking a lot of detail and information, but I hope it might have given you a rough idea of what I meant when I said my masking fluid situation reminded me of Kintsugi and Wabi-Sabi. Personally, I've been dealing with perfectionism for most of my life. And I think perfectionism, like many things, can be both good and bad. For me, i found that lately it's been holding me back more than it helped me, so I'm actively trying to practice to rather finish something and keep things raw than to overthink and eventually lose inspiration. Feeling grateful and finding love for the seemingly unfinished, the inconspicuous and even for what we might call mistakes, is a great point of view for me. Kintsugi and especially Wabi Sabi helped me a lot with this. Focusing our minds on appreciation instead of perfection can have almost magical effects. It certainly shifted my way of thinking. Nothing is perfect, no matter how hard we try. Perfection is so relative and subjective anyways once you think about it. Imperfection, on the other hand, is authentic and relatable. It's interesting and inspiring. And although it's something that I have to remind myself of on a regular basis, I found that it gets easier with time. Habits, you know. How do you feel about this? I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
So the third big thing this painting has taught me was this. If things don't go as planned, stay cool. Because chances are, your painting might not even need fixing. Try to appreciate it for its journey. It makes it unique. It tells a story. Isn't that amazing? But back to the painting. Here I started to add highlights to the rooftops in the distance. I actually kind of like the masking fluid's blue tint for this part, because in the original photograph the values became much more bluish towards the background anyways. But I also wanted to add a bit of clean white to add interest. After adding some more layers of white to the trees, I've switched to watercolour pencils. I felt like the houses and rooftops could use a tiny bit more dimension. I still wanted to keep it abstract, but I figured a little bit of perspective might add to the overall impression. Watercolour pencils are great because you have the same control that you have with regular pencils, but after you've applied them, you can just use a brush and a little bit of water to activate the colour. Then you can just basically use them like watercolour. They're really great for beginners to play around with in my opinion, especially if you're more used to sketching and a little intimidated by brushes and colour. They're great fun to use. I tried to match the colours that I'd already used, but picked a darker shade to support the impression of light coming down from the top. I think this is a nice example of how these small details don't look like much in the beginning, but after a while, even though it's subtle, it really starts to make a difference. And I realised that I very much like the look of the pencil strokes and chose not to activate the colour after all. So I could have just used regular pencils, but that's how it goes sometimes. Now, I felt like as I had added a lot of sakura blossoms, there was a bit of a gap between the treetops and the background, and I also wanted to create a bit more of a visual separation of the two. So I went ahead and just filled the space with shades of green, using watercolour pencils. This time I activated the colour, and you can see how nicely that created a smooth transition. It's a bit tricky to add background later on in the picture, and in hindsight I should have done that much earlier. But it was alright. I was just paying extra attention to get in between the cherry blossoms as much as possible and also decided to add a few more on top to make the separation look more natural. Two of the side branches were still missing as I'd added them in a bit later on, so I just used a few strokes to draw them in between the blossoms. I also added a few more details to the branches of the lower trees and then decided to go back to my watercolours for some darker purple spots between the trees to add back a tiny bit of depth. Now I'm going back to white again, working the purple in. Sometimes these steps might seem redundant, but layering is fun, and even if it seems like some details get lost again, in my experience it still does make a difference, and the outcome looks a bit more nuanced. And I'm sure there's ways to do all of this in a nicer or more efficient way. A professional artist would probably go about this very, very differently, but 
you know, it's really fun to discover what works for you and what doesn't, and to just learn by doing. Next up were the stairs and the bottom part of the picture. First I wanted to give the background next to the stairs a bit more definition, so I added a bit of a grassy slight slope. I used watercolour pencils again to be able to blend everything together. A darker green for the more distant area and a lighter one for the parts on top. Now I'm using clean water again to activate the colour. I wasn't trying to be overly precise here because I already knew that I wanted to add a few more sakura branches on top of the handrail to make it look a bit more included. I really like the saturation, it's such a pretty and friendly spring green. For the stairs, I wanted to give them a little more texture, so I added stone shapes and a tiny bit of shading. Again with watercolour pencils to soften everything out afterwards. It did take me a minute to figure out how I wanted it to look like. I wanted the stairs to just lead the view into the painting and avoid too many details that would draw too much attention. I used a wet brush to soften the colours and a piece of paper towel to get rid of some pigment again as it felt a bit too overpowering for the scene. It needed to look less defined and more used. Sometimes it just takes a bit of back and forth until it feels right. I tried using a bit of white there in the end, but it didn't really work, and the paper was still wet, so I switched over to the left to focus on the trees for a while. I wanted to add a few more trunks, so I just used different shades of brown and placed them wherever it seemed right. It was nice to see how the area immediately started to look more lively. I also put a bit of noise into the greenery for the same effect. That was about where I realised that I was about to finish the painting, and it was really cool to see how everything came together in the end. I was so, so glad that I hadn't given up on it, and this was honestly the first time that I was looking forward to have something that I painted hanging up on my apartment wall. I know a lot of artists have this issue that they can't look at their art for too long because they tend to see only the mistakes they made, according to their judgement of course. So changing my mindset during the process of this painting has helped me in an enormous way. I can still see so many things that I would have wanted to undo and redo about this picture before I went through this change of perspective, but now I truly see them as something that is hard to describe, but that feels right. This painting is very personal for me because I feel like I've grown while I've worked on it. It has its own character and history and it tells its own story. I wouldn't change a thing about it anymore. But we're not completely done yet. Afterwards, I moved on to the handrail and used some grey shades to add a bit of dimension to it. Using clear water again, I carefully and just very lightly blended the colours as I didn't want to smudge the edges.
When the paper had finally dried, I picked up a piece of white pastel chalk and applied it all over the stairs. I loved that it made it look a bit more sandy and used. Chalk pastels are easy to apply and mix using your fingers. I don't know why, but they always give me this fancy artist feeling. They're so great. It can get quite messy rather quickly though, so be careful about your surroundings when you use them. The powder just gets everywhere if you're not careful. Thankfully I didn't have to worry about that too much by just using very light colours. Eventually I used a dark brown pencil to redefine some of the stair edges and applied a bit of ochre pastel for some finishing touches. Then I added some highlights to the railing. There's a lot of uncovered masking fluid left, but I didn't mind and just left it as is to tell its part of the story. Lastly, I went on to put in a final layer of sakura branches and blossoms to make the handrail feel more naturally incorporated into the scene. A little overgrown. I'm sure the trees get cut back quite vigorously to make sure all of the tourists can have a safe way back down from the Churejo Pagoda. But I still like to imagine this at a bit less frequented point in time. A tiny bit more wild and adventurous, but still calm and serene. Just how I felt sitting there watching Mount Fuji on this day. By the way, another reason to visit the Churi to Pagoda first thing in the morning is that this undisturbed view of Mount Fuji can be pretty rare. Mount Fuji is often called a shy mountain because it often hides between the clouds. It's not uncommon for tourists to not catch a glimpse of it during their entire trip to Japan. But if you get up early, your chances for a cloud-free view are a lot higher. It seems like 6am is a great time, but I also managed to get good views all the way up till 10 in the morning, at least in March and April. The earlier the better though. Also, generally speaking, the winter months with cold temperatures seem to offer the highest chances for a clear view, especially December till February. The weather conditions during summertime make it rather difficult though because the higher temperatures will cause a lot of clouds to form around the mountaintop. So, July, August and September might give you a hard time. That doesn't necessarily mean you won't be able to see this gorgeous mountain at all though. You might just need a little bit of luck and patience. Plus, partially clouded Fujisan looks mysterious and beautiful as well. Once I was happy with the branches, I wanted to simply add some light pink colour back in. Using white paint only had made the new parts stand out against the previous ones. Now the only thing that was left was to place my signature into the corner here. Yay! Before I was able to frame the painting, I first had to get rid of the tape I had used to mark its edges. The tape is also meant to keep the paper from warping to a certain degree, but we already know that didn't work out so well. Usually it's easy to remove it, you just carefully pull it away. But the thing is, it's a good idea to test how well the tape works with the paper you're using, and Maybe don't leave the tape on for a year, so, well, while it did pull off some of the paper, I chose not to mind. It kind of makes sense for this painting, doesn't it? And 
Aren't we all a little rough around the edges? I did enjoy seeing the clean lines though. It's as if you're looking through a window to see beautiful Mount Fuji here amidst the sakura, just waiting for you. And this is how it looks like hung up on my wall. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really hope you've enjoyed it. See you soon.